Take two of fall 2018. Hello and welcome to another episode of GWTV's Unstoppable, the best place for you to catch up on all the GW sports news you didn't know you needed to know. As the graphic is probably telling you right now, I'm Cole Anchuski. Sitting next to me, my co-anchor, Sean Grant. On today's show, we'll kick off the rundown with a little sneak peek of men's and women's basketball, telling you what to watch out for once the season gets underway later this month. After that, we'll check in on men's and women's soccer, women's volleyball, men's and women's cross country, men's water polo, and men's tennis. We'll round out the show by letting our own Parker Jensen back onto the stage for an encore to see if he can stir the pot between Cole and I in a quick unstoppable hot take segment. We'll then let Parker wrap things up by letting you know which upcoming games you just can't miss. All this on Unstoppable. Right wing, good! As the old adage goes, third time's the charm. The 2018-2019 basketball season is here, and Maurice Joseph returns for his third season as the head coach of the George Washington University basketball team. The Colonials finished with a 20-15 record in Coach Joseph's first season. GW then experienced regression the following season, finishing with a record of 15-18. In addition, the Colonials lose their top scorer and rebounder, Yudawa Anabe, and veteran big man Patrick Steves. To make things worse, the Colonials lose Jair Bolden, who transferred to South Carolina, a Final Four team in 2017. Nevertheless, with three talented incoming freshmen and multiple returning players, the Colonials hope to turn around their upcoming season. GW finished ranked 309th in total offense with 67.4 points per game and allowed an average of 70.3 points per contest. Their offense was less desirable. Sean, I want to ask you a simple question. Do you see improvement, stagnation, or more trouble for the Colonials? You know, honestly, Cole, I think it's going to be a mixed bag. I think we can see, you know, a whole different, uh, you know, so many different outcomes can come from this season. My biggest concern is the massive turnover that's going on in the front court. You talked about, you know, uh, losing Bolden. You talked about losing Watanabe. Uh, you know, you're losing some of these key players that have been with you and have been with Coach Joseph since he started. Uh, you know, and I think... You look at still who's on this team. You've got Arnaldo Toro. He's going into his junior year. Uh, you know, he's probably one of the most veteran players on this team and a player they're going to look to for leadership. Uh, you know, I think that he had some progress last season from his freshman year. I think he's definitely evolved his game, um, you know, but with a team that's kind of lacking in size like they are, you need a more experienced big man like Toro to really work in the paint. And last season, I think we saw him shoot a lot more mid-range jumpers, uh, you know, really trying to play a different kind of offensive, uh, you know, offensive game than he needs to in order to be effective. Uh, you know, I, I just, again, I think this team is lackluster in the size department, especially last year we saw them struggle uh, when going up against bigger teams that could out-rebound them. You know, and rebounding is huge when you're trying to control the pace of a game and, and also, you know, on the defensive end, if you, you got to limit second chance opportunities, and this is something Something that that this team struggled with uh, but you know they do like you said have some younger players that could come in and in you know and be important for them I think you should look at forward uh, Mezzi Offram uh, he's another guy he's a 6'6 six, six forward he produced 11.8 uh, points 6.7 rebounds per game last year as a senior at Georgetown prep you know definitely a player that could step up uh, you know I also think you got to look at 6'9 forward Javier Langarica wait wait wait, uh, wait 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 did did you say Javier Langarica I, I did I did yeah yeah isn't yeah. he Basque I, you know, I, yeah, I, he I, is. I, yeah, he's Basque. Okay, yeah, I, I guess I, he's Basque. I, I, I'm Basque. All right, anyway, continue. He, okay. Well, anyway, you know, Javier was used sparingly in 2017, 2018, uh, but I think he'll have a much bigger role this season again with such with the small amount of size that they have. He's going to get some playing time, I think. Yeah, you mentioned the loss of Jair, and I certainly think that loss is going to be felt. He racked up 11.2 points a game, 3.1 assists, and three rebounds through 32 games last season. However, in the latter half of the season, Bolden took the back seat to uh, Justin Missoula. Mm -hmm. It was the Justin Missoula show later on um, and the final concluding games. But Missoula's production was lackluster. And this year, I honestly think his role is going to be keeping Terry Nolan's junior shadow nice and cozy, mm -hmm. which is tough for me to say, but it's true. He averaged 9.1 points, 3.2 assists, and 2.5 rebounds per game. And he also played great defense with 1.6 steals per game. So I think Nolan is poised to have a breakout season this year. Um, so look for him to be a big contributor. And Sean, here's a name that you haven't heard before, Armel Potter. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a recent transfer from Charleston Southern. 
Um, in his sophomore year there, he shot 45% from the field. Um, he had 12.7 points per game, and he was the uh, team leader in assists. Um, so he's going to be a big impact player. He's going to fit well with uh, with Missoula, he's gonna fit well with Nolan. Um, so I think the size, athleticism, and talent that our GW backcourt has, that's something that we're really gonna have to hang our hat on. Mm -hmm. um, so look for them to be key, uh, key contributors. But like you said, I think we're really gonna have to pay attention to our big men and our rebounding, our defensive rim protection, mm -hmm. um, and those guys up front and how they play. Have a short memory. That's the sentiment that Coach Jennifer Rosati should preach to her players as she moves into her third season at the helm of the women's basketball program. After posting an impressive 19 and 14 regular season record and tearing through an A-10 tournament that included a win over topped ranked Dayton last year, the team suffered a disappointing loss to Ohio State in the NCAA tournament. While many players voiced discontent with their efforts after that loss, it's not something they should dwell on if they want to build momentum into this season. The team lost some incredible veteran leaders last year, but return a solid core that features seniors Malin Bautista and Kelsey Mahoney. They also boast decent size with a host of young forwards who can complement the play of those senior leaders. Sophomore forward Mila Luma is a player you need to be aware of. She's a double-double threat every time she steps on the floor. The key for this team will be replicating the defensive dominance from last year when they forced opponents to commit around 16 turnovers a game. Cole. I'll fire the same question that you asked me right back at you. What's the floor and what's the ceiling for this team in 2018-2019? You know, Sean, I think the ceiling is pretty high. Any time that you make it to the NCAA tournament, you're expected to do great things the following year. Now, even though they took a really tough loss to Ohio State, mm -hmm. their team was by far and away uh, a, a shock to, to most of us uh, in the GW sports community. So I really think that they're gonna have a good year. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that their non-conference road schedule um, isn't that tough. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of home games, which is really gonna get the Colonials off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. That's gonna allow the younger players to settle in. Um, and that's just gonna get the momentum going for this season. Yeah, and now, you know, Cole, we also talk a lot about chemistry with this team. You know, chemistry is important, something that's important for any team, especially one that struggles on the offensive end at times, you know, like we saw happen with this team last year. Where do you think they need to improve their efforts the most on the offensive end? They need to rely less on the three ball. They shot 626 three-pointers last year, which is absolutely absurd. I know you have good three-point shooters in Malin Batista, but if you can start looking more toward your forwards and looking more towards paint production, I think that's really going to improve the offense. Uh, you mentioned Luma. I think the offense really just needs to go like through her. Mm -hmm. um, she's a great player, a double-double monster, um, so she can have a huge impact. And if GW just focuses focuses in on getting those easy buckets, points in transition, and points in the paint, I think their season's going to improve. Yeah. But, you know, with so much size, don't you think a team should really rally all those three-point shooters around the big men and then have, you know, have those big men, big women crash the glass and get more offensive boards? You know, that works for some teams, and I think Batista is a good facilitator, but if you just get her in situations where she can distribute the ball and isn't necessarily relying on her shot, mm -hmm. I think the offense is going to be much more cohesive and it's just going to flow better. And in those tougher games against non-conference opponents and even in potential ch tournament games, um, it's just going to be be a, a, a much better way to go about doing things um, and it's just going to lead to more success. So who do you think is going to be key for the team's success? Well we talked about Luma, we talked about Batista, but I think we also need to talk about Mahoney. Her combination of size and shooting ability um, is very impressive so look to her to make big contributions and she's going to be an asset for Batista going forward um, and those two seniors they're going to be huge for uh, for Coach Rosati so um, that's kind of how they're going to strive for their run, mm -hmm. um, and I think they're going to be the most important players going forward. Since we last talked, the GW men's soccer team has fallen into a tailspin. In their last five matches, the Colonials have gone 1-2-2 two, and two against conference opponents. After beating St. Bonaventure 4-0, GW took a fat L against VCU. GW then had two overtime ties to Fordham and LaSalle. Quick side note, Sean also worked overtime twice this week at Astro Donut. So if you want to enjoy a sweet and savory treat while talking sports with your favorite anchor, pay him a visit. Anyway, Dylan Lightborn continues to play well, but the Colonials are currently ranked 12th in the Atlantic 10 Conference. Nevertheless, GW does have an opportunity to play its way into the 18th field for the conference championship over the final week of the regular season. 
And now, you know, talking about how this team has performed since we last checked in on them, Cole, uh, you know, this is really not the performances that they needed. Uh, you Absolutely. know, the offense has gone stagnant. They've gotten outscored six to three in their last four games. It's really seemed like the same issues that, you know, that we touched on last time have continued to plague this team. They rely too much on their defense and on goalie Thorne Arnhoof to shut teams out. Uh, you know, the offense doesn't control the ball enough. They don't set a good pace. They're letting the other team kind of dictate, uh, you know, the style of play for the entire game. They're also just not getting off enough shots. They're not putting enough pressure on opposing defenses. You know, even in games where they get shots off, the number of quality shots or shots on target still remains pretty low. Uh, you know, this could be caused by the strength of the defenses that they're playing against. Uh, but I also feel like it's a matter of a lack of communication between offensive players. You know, you touched on the fact that Dylan Lightbourne is playing well right now, and, and that is important for them. But I think as a senior leader, he needs to facilitate more. He needs to get those younger players involved. It's not just about him scoring. It's about him making sure that offense can support the defense and support, you know, their goalie. So I really think if they want to make a run over these last couple games and maybe make their way into that eight-team uh, playoff field, like you said, they were going to need to change something up. Yeah, and this is not to totally discount the efforts of the team. They've had a pretty tough schedule. They play teams like UMBC, Fordham, and VCU, whose records are well above 500. But the loss to LaSalle, that was atrocious. Come on, guys. Um, you really can't lose games like that later on in the season um, because that just tanks your momentum going into championship play. Yeah, and touching on that, you know, Cole, that team was 2-10-3 and three at the time. You know, you never want to really say, oh, this you're always going to beat this team. You know the phrase, any given Sunday. Uh, you know, but that was a game that they needed to win, and they didn't. Uh, and, you know, with two games left, hopefully they can pick up some wins so they finish higher than 12th in the A-10. On the flip side of the pitch, the women's soccer team continues to push through their season, and after a 3-2 and two stretch in their last five games, they sit at a comfortable 10-7-1 record. In these last five games, they picked up wins against A-10 rivals like Richmond, Dayton, and Davidson. The offense has really come alive for the women as they scored nine goals in that stretch, showing they can compete in conference. Their last game, however, was a tough loss to a St. Louis team with a 15-3-1 record. A win there definitely would have bolstered their resume, but now the question remains, what kind of team will we see play in the A-10 tournament? The team that puts together a full game or the inconsistent team with a tendency to falter against tougher competition? Cole, what are your thoughts on this? I'm not necessarily sure what team we're going to get, but there certainly is incentive for the team to play well. This is going to be their sixth consecutive appearance in the Atlantic 10 Championship. Um, and this team is marked by grit and competitiveness. They've played four overtime games and they've won three of them and tied one of them. So this team definitely has the composure uh, to play well in the championship. So I think that's something that you have to look out for. And Sean, as you mentioned, the Colonials have been nipping at the heels at some of the best opponents in the conference. Uh, they took a loss to uh, St. Louis 2-0, but that game was highly competitive. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can basically call this soccer team Lil John because they're all about the shots. Uh, they've racked up 278 shots this season, which is well above league average. Um, and one thing that I really want to focus on, though, is that they're still committing a lot of fouls. 147, Sean. 147 fouls. Yeah. Uh, I feel bad for their opponent's shins. Um, <laughs> But the amount of fouls tells a different story. GW really predicates themselves on having a stout defense, mm -hmm. and they're going to continue that in tournament play. Um, so look for them to uh, continue that high octane, aggressive defense. They've only allowed 1.24 uh, goals um, on the season average, mm -hmm. and this season has all been uh, has been about Sophia Pavon. Uh, she's been the cornerstone of GW's offense and will continue to play well in this uh, Atlanta. Yeah, no, and if you look at her stats, Cole, you know, seven goals and six assists, it really shows that she's not just going to try and take it herself and score. She can score or she'll set opponents or her teammates up, rather. And when you're looking at that, you know, that, that's the kind of player that you need, you know, even touching back to what we talked about with the men's soccer team and how you need a player that's going to facilitate as much as they can produce themselves. You know, I think that's an example that we need to look to, that of Sophia Pavan. And again, when they're trying to gonna make this late push in the A-10 tournament, she's going to be critical for them. The women's cross country team continues to run strong. The Colonials recently added another top 30 performance to their resume at the Princeton Invitational. Suzanne Danaheim was the pacemaker for the race and finished with a time of 21 minutes and 59 seconds to place 20th. Additionally, three underclassmen, Margaret Coogan, Mariah Morrow, and Catherine Nohilly, finished in scoring spots for the Colonials. Quite the opposite of the success for the women's cross-country team, 
the women's volleyball team skidded through their last seven games, losing out and pushing their record to 8-14 overall. Not only have they lost those last seven games, but they haven't seemed competitive as they lost nearly every match, either three sets to one or three sets to none. On top of that, the scores of the sets that they lose are rather lopsided at times, like in the match against Davidson, where they lost the first and third sets, each by a score of 25 to 12. Part of the skid could be explained by the fact that GW has played more games on the road than at home, but overall, it seems like this team has just been plagued by inconsistency. Unstoppable's own Jason Rucker got a chance to catch up with the team. Let's see what they had to say about their recent performances. Good morning. Today we're here at the Charles E. Smith Center where the GW women's volleyball team is practicing for their upcoming match against rival George Mason this Thursday. At the time of recording, the team has hit a rough patch, losing six straight, including most recently a very painful loss at Duquesne after leading by two sets. This drops their record to 8-13 moving them into eighth place tied to Fordham. Let's go inside and talk to some players. So a big theme of ours was attention to detail. And I feel like if we really hone in on that and really place all our focuses on these last, like last practices and really apply that towards gameplay, I feel like we can pull something out. So I feel like there's a couple of leaders on our team. There's obviously our seniors, which have the experience you have Jamie and Skyler, which um, there are a few returners that I believe are leaders. And I also believe that even one of our freshmen, uh, Bella Bowman, who is a starter, has really placed kind of like his first step into leadership. And I feel like she's really done a good job, especially being a starter. Yeah, I feel like what we need to do to snap out of this losing streak is to all get on board with the one common goal, which is to win games. and to play with each other and have fun and have joy when we play. And I think that the coaches have really brought a bunch of aspects and tools to help us win uh, in games and they know how to win. I would say there's a little bit extra emotion being my senior year, but I've grown up with sports in my life and it's a way to, it's something I'm very passionate about and a way to express myself. And I've learned life lessons through volleyball. And I think that being my senior year, yes, it has affected me. The, these past two games were really crucial in moving on to the tournament, and we lost them. And that was really hard for me because I knew that I'm not going to get a second chance at the tournament. Me and Kelsey aren't going to get a second chance at the tournament. You know, maybe if I was a junior, I wouldn't have hit me as hard, but being a senior, it's, it's really time to make an impact and time to leave a mark or do something that's going to be remembered for a while. For Unstoppable and WTV, I'm Jason Rucker. Thanks, Jason. Unlike George Washington University's school ranking, the national ranking of the men's water polo team continues to climb. The Colonials are currently 16 and 5 and are ranked 19th in the country. Atticon Destici continues to do Atticon Destici things. He has tallied 64 goals this season and netted his 200th goal of his career in a recent match. He also has 46 assists and is the definition of a team player. Andrew Mavis has also been an offensive powerhouse. He has 57 goals on the season. GW continues to up the ante on the defensive side of the pool as well. Austin Perch and Matt Taylor have been playing well in the net, setting the Colonials up for success in the later portions of the season. Laced up and ready to go just like the women's team, men's cross country charges into the A-10 championships this weekend following their last meet, the Princeton Invitational. While their team placement wasn't as high as they liked in that race, as they placed 10 out of 20 teams, several individuals registered quality performances that show they're ready for more competition. Sophomore Jackson Cronin registered the best individual performance. His 24-minute, 47.4 second time in the 8K event was a personal record and the third fastest 8K time in program history. And while the Colonials didn't place highly overall, their ranking of 10th was the second highest for any A-10 team at the meet. All this shows that the team and their fans should be excited for the A-10 championships. We wish them, and especially our general manager, Andy Weber, the best of luck. Well, Sean, it's a shame we aren't debating right now because I love it when we volley back and forth. But now moving on to a team who can certainly volley better than us, the men's tennis team, as the boys performed well recently at the Navy Blue Invite and the ITA Atlantic Regional. Production from freshmen has continued to be the theme for the men as three first years claimed flight titles at the Navy Invite. Junior Jacob Bahoon showed veteran leadership for the team in the ITA Atlantic Regional advancing all the way to the round of 32. 
With the Navy Gold Invite being the last scheduled event for the fall, we look for more strong performances from the first years, which indicates the direction that the program will head in. We're going to head to a quick commercial break right now, but when we come back, Parker Jensen will stand at the podium and try and pass some judgment on how well me and Cole can argue with each other. This is the all-new GW Shuttle Bus for our Vern Express and BSTC Express, making the same stops on the same schedules, but with some major upgrades. Oh look, here you are now. Look how happy you are. This is one of your drivers. Look how happy he is. Smile and wave at him. Learn your driver's name. What do all those buttons do? Everything. What does the most important button do? Wi-Fi. If you're on the shuttle, you're connected. You'll be tweeting about the smooth ride, snapping about our leather seats, and everything will be hashtag seatbelts, hashtag air conditioning, hashtag blessed. Every bus is full of USB charging stations. Every shuttle is equipped with a bike rack. We can get every GW student where they need to go, and you'll always find your ride now that we're decked out in a beautiful bumper-to-bumper -bumper buff and blue. Where can you hop on these wonderful new shuttles? You can pick up the Mount Vernon shuttle at Funger Hall or at the Red Cross building. Heading to VSTC, we'll pick you up at Funger and stop at four VSTC buildings before heading back to Foggy Bar. So hop aboard our new shuttle buses, sleep easy, and dream about what really matters, that deli bagel. Welcome to Hot Takes. I'm your moderator, Parker Jensen. The premise of this segment is simple. I'll be throwing out hot takes at our two anchors, and they'll respond by getting verbally aggressive with each other for your viewing pleasure. Let's start off with men's basketball, more specifically, the loss of Jair Bolden. Bolden was a breakout star his freshman year, but regressed into an ISO player during his sophomore stint, where his play started to deteriorate. He has now moved on to South Carolina as a transfer. Do you think benching Jair was the right choice, even though that ultimately led to his departure from the team? Oh, Cole, I'll let you start off on this one. We already kind of touched on it earlier. Absolutely. I think Mojo made an egregious error. Jair was such a talented player. Like, are you kidding me? And he just lets Justin Missoula start over him, who in his play was, like, actually abysmal. Like, he was so bad. He, he had, like, 1.2 points on the season for his average, although he was able to kind of facilitate the offense a little bit better. Um, I just think Jair was by far and away the better player. And it's not like he doesn't have talent. South Carolina, who was a Final Four team in 2017, picked him up and was like happy to take him. So I think that it was an awful mistake by uh, Coach Joseph. I don't know. I'm going to disagree with you here, Cole. I really, you know, I, I was so disappointed with the way that Jair regressed from his freshman year into his sophomore year. And now you can kind of gloss over it and, and, and say that, yeah, maybe he went into a sophomore slump. You know, he was just trying to figure some other things out, stepping into a bigger role as a leader on the team. Yeah, I don't uh, think it was regression. I think it was just Jair taking on a bigger role and him being more in the spotlight. Uh, no, I, Coach I, Joseph I, just asked more of him. He was taking more shots because we literally didn't have any other offensive player. So I think it was just his play uh, and his extended play that made him look bad. I, don't, I, I think when you're looking at his shot selection, though, in games, it was terrible. It, his shot selection was just terrible, Cole. Now, when you saw him out on the floor... But who his, else other his, than Yuta was shooting shots? Sure. I, 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 I'll give you that, right? He was the main offensive player. He needed to produce for his team. But if you look if you look at the kind of shots that he took from his freshman year to his sophomore year, in his freshman year, he was such an aggressive driver, and he constantly attacked the rim. I think the biggest thing that he's got going for him is his size. He's a 6'4 guard. You know, he's got some muscle on him he's able to, to you know he's, he's stronger than most of these other guards he's playing against and that allows him he's got some good handles some good court vision that makes him a natural driver wanna, and a natural I wanna, slasher. I want to back this up just a little bit because in his freshman campaign he had Yuta he had Tyra Kavanaugh who mm -hmm. is now in the NBA playing extremely well um, for his role so he had wings that he could facilitate to and he didn't need to be the point scorer but he, had, he didn't he, need he to had be Yuta in his shooter. sophomore year too I don't know my thing is, is he was asked to take a higher percentage of three-point shots, and, and 
but here's but, here, but, like but here's my point. Here's my point is that it wasn't three point shots. So when I'm talking about his shot selection, right? I also would have been fine if he shot a lot of threes, even if he missed them, right? Maybe he's shooting at a 30% clip. That's not great, but that still would have been more than what he was giving. When you watched his play, he would, as as Parker mentioned, he was more of an ISO player. He would come up, he would take a few dribbles, he would survey, see what the play was, see where you know what open players were. Then he'd maybe make a crossover move, and then he'd pull up from the elbow or or, or just inside the three point line. So he was shooting those super low percentage shots of twos just inside the three point arc. And I just I thought that was terrible for the team. And it was always within the first eight seconds of the shot clock. So you're really not giving your offense a chance to, my, my to run. My thing is this wasn't a Jair problem. This was a Coach Joseph problem, and not supplying Jair with better guards, better wings, and better people that he could facilitate the ball to and surround him. So I think it's a recruiting issue. Now, hopefully with the transfers that we do have and the incoming freshmen, it'll be able to rectify some of the problems that we're having. But when you don't surround a player like that and ask a lot of him, of course he's gonna break under pressure. Well, okay, I'll, I'll give you that. You know, Coach Joseph might not have recruited well and didn't have a good supporting cast for him in his sophomore campaign, but I don't think that that's an excuse for bad shot selection. And yes, I'll agree with you. I think it also stems from a coaching issue, the, the, you know, the regression that we saw from him. I think that Coach Joseph needed to be harder on him. I think he needed to get him to fit more into the game plan that he was trying to run, and I don't think he did that, but I still think it's a matter of Jair's shot selection. You could see it on his face. A lot of the shots that he took were also rushed and hurried. He, he almost felt like he, he had to. Yeah, because he did. But but he but the thing is, he didn't. He didn't need to take those low percentage shots. He could have. He I'm saying he could have. He was a, he was a pretty decent foul shooter too. I, he could have drawn gone in, tr tried to draw some contact. I you know. I don't know, Sean. I think all GW basketball fans are going to be ruined today when they see Jair Bolden on a South Carolina team making a tournament run push and doing extremely well in the SEC. Yeah, that's well, all I got to say about that. Well, we'll dis we'll agree to disagree for now. Well, let's move this thing forward to uh, women's basketball whose play last year surprised many and are looking to continue their success into this year. With many big names coming back and loads of young talent looking to take the reins, who do you think will be the breakout player this year? I think it's Batista. Hmm. I mean, I, I think I'm going to go with Neil Luma. I know how I said earlier that you could look at, you know, you can also look at Kelsey Mahoney. I think there's a lot of players who could be important on this team. Uh, my take is Neil Luma. I think getting back to the fact that they that they need to use their size, they need to be more dominant in the paint. Um, you know, I think Bautista is incredible. We, again, another pl another athlete who we've talked about extensively on this show. Uh, you know, for her efforts, she's an incredible facilitator. She's a, she's a really good shooter, and she really acts like a floor general at the point guard position. Uh, but yeah, she's like everything that you want in a player. Right, but I think Luma is more important. You know, you saw the way that she was able to break out as a freshman, and she's also a sophomore. So it's great when you can get those solid performances from you know your very young players because those are the building blocks that you know hopefully you are able to build up to a team that can make a run in the NCAA tournament. Let me say this, Coach Rosati a former UConn coach, they relied heavily on three-point shots. And UConn is one of the best three-point shooting team in NCAA women's history. And I think Rosati sees that same kind of prowess in Batista, and I think she does have that prowess. And GW's offense is going to be all about the three ball again. I mean, we mentioned it in our vamp points that like it would be okay if we saw a little bit of a uh, deviation from that. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, Rosati is going to rely heavily on Batista. She is going to put up great three-point numbers. And like you said, she's going to continue to be that floor general that she is. She is going to uh, absolutely uh, dominate uh, the defensive end of the ball. She's a quick perimeter defender. Um, so I, I, I really think that she's poised to be one of the best players in the Atlantic 10, and she's going to lead this team to a, another tournament appearance. I, but that's why I just think by the nature of her game as that floor general. And, you know, I think when we've watched them play in the past, it's always been she looks to pass before she looks to shoot. And, 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 and she even looks to make several passes before they even get a shot off. You know, if you're talking about teams that rush shots into the shot clock, well, you know, like we talked about with Jair a little bit ago, I think she's the opposite of that, and she's looking to make at least three or four passes before she even takes a shot. So... I don't think that she's going to be shooting a three ball a lot. In fact, I think that, you know, I think this team recognized that, you know, part of their struggles stemmed from, you know, when they went cold from beyond the arc, their offense just really stagnated. And, and I think, you know, as you said, with Rosati being that UConn women's coach, 
you know, she, she knows how to look at a player and say, you know, this player is going to be very talented and, and this is what I need to build on. And I think she's recognized that in Luma, you know, one of the best freshman performances that we've seen from a player, you know, in recent memory. And I think that she's going to look to build on that. And I think that, you know, she's going to say to Bautista, you really got to set these younger players up. A and, you know, as a result, I mean, let's say that this team shifts, you know, and they, they focus a lot more on scoring in the paint. And then other teams kind of adjust to that. And then so then teams start to collapse in the paint. That's when you'll see that three-point shooting start to pick up in games. That's why I think Luma is going to be the key for this team. Yeah, I, I actually want to see Batista's role expand. Like you said, she is almost a pass-first point guard. Mm -hmm. She just needs to be Steph Curry. Like, she just needs to run up to the three-point line and just huck up threes. And in addition to her assisting ability, um, that's just going to make the team better. I think she's this superstar that GW needs. Um, and if her play expands and she takes on that I'm going to go get mine mentality, um, she's, she's going to do nothing but great things. I think the main things they have to look at is experience against just complete and utter dominance. I mean, Neela Luma is an incredible player. She can do everything on the offensive side and the defensive side of the ball. But Batista brings something to the table that a lot of others can't with this young roster, and that's experience, and especially experience with a winning team. Now, I understand Luma was on that winning team, but when you have a leader who was already established on that team last year, I think having the experience going into this year is going to be something great for that team. So, so we'll see how the women do this year. Let's move on to a fun subject, Sean's hair. While Sean Grant has rocked various hairstyles over the years, nothing has prepared us for his most recent decision to leave his hair down. While I'm personally a fan of his gelled up hair, what do you guys think was Sean's best look so far? Yeah, you can't see it now, but Sean's starting to do this thing where he kind of has this like sideward swoop. Now, me personally, I prefer short hair bowl cut, Sean. Like, that's by far the best. Um, so yeah, should I, I should, should I weigh in on my own my own hair personally? Yeah, what was styles? your what was your? I mean, uh, I think you know, just speaking for myself personally, uh, it, it's a matter of convenience versus you know the look. I think on days like this, I like to have my hair gelled up because, you know, we're sports anchors. We're supposed to look professional, but it does get annoying when you have to do that every morning. I'm really, you know, I, I'm really a big fan now of the new look that I'm rocking with just letting it hang down. Um, you know, I don't know, but sometimes I got to do what I got to do to appease the fans. Maybe I should switch it back to that bowl cut. So after this last question, I want to let it be known that I want to punch myself in the face extremely hard. Um, Parker, what well, do you think? My own personal take, like I said in the intro, I do appreciate the, uh, the gelled up hair. Now, I, I do understand where you're trying to go with that look with the hair down, but uh, the personally, from a person who's, hand, who's had his uh, hair spiked up for, for quite some time now, I feel like uh, just gelled up is the right way to go. But that's my personal take. You don't ask the moderator. so. Uh, okay. All right, well, that was miserable. <laughs> We're going to go to a quick commercial break now, but when we come back, Parko will let you know which upcoming games to watch. Stay tuned. Raise high. This isn't just our battle cry. It's our call, our challenge. Because when you were called to Washington, you were called to higher expectations to a higher standard. We are called here to advance knowledge, to serve society, to change the world. Is that too lofty, too aspirational? Is it simply too much to expect? Not if your classroom is a Smithsonian, the IMF, or on the doorstep of the Supreme Court. Not if you have access to the most hallowed institutions and formidable leaders. Not if you are given the tools to change minds, shape laws, influence entire fields of study, advance our way of life, change the course of history. From the nation's capital to the four corners of the earth, to far below the surface and far beyond our atmosphere, here, unique opportunities, the ones that many people work much of their lives to get, are within your reach from the moment you arrive. This is where you find new pathways for preventing global epidemics where your unexpected friend propels a new scientific movement forward. This is where you push forward as a team to break records and reach new heights. Where your classroom is 68 square miles of the most consequential land on earth. This is where you will make it happen. This is the George Washington University. And what we make is history. So stand up, be bold, take risks, Press on, push harder, raise high. Welcome back. 
Let's start off with Unstoppable Player of the Month, Suzanne Danaheim, who in her performance in the 6K at the historic Paul Short Run, put up a time of 21 minutes and 10 seconds, making that the third best time in that event in GW's history. The junior came in 19th out of 350 runners and captured the top A-10 time in that event. Danaheim has been making her name known, coming in 2nd, 5th, and 19th in her past three meets, and has become GW's top woman runner this year. We wish her the best of luck as the team goes on to race in the A-10 championships this weekend. And now it's time for the games that you just can't miss. Men's basketball will be opening up their season against Stony Brook on Tuesday, November 6th at 7 p.m. They will also be taking on a red-hot Virginia team who's ranked 5th in the nation and will be sure to test GW's defensive abilities. That game will be on Sunday, November 11th at 2 p.m. on the ACC Network. Women's basketball will have their season opener on Thursday, November 8th at 7 p.m. as the Lady Colonials will take on the Dukes of James Madison. The women's team will also look to avenge their last year's 72-52 loss to Princeton on Sunday, November 11th at 2 p.m. And don't forget to check out women's and men's swimming as they take on Howard on Saturday, November 10th at 1 p.m. And those are the games that you just can't miss. But before I go, I would just like to say good luck to our own Andy Weber as he goes on to compete in the men's cross-country NCAA Mid-Atlantic Regional. Back to you guys. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. As always, follow us on Instagram at GWTV underscore unstoppable and follow us on Facebook for new content when you want it most. We'll see you next time.